Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 37. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Cana. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Our second reading comes from Genesis chapter 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land for two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you and for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go to my father and say to him, thus your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt, come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herd, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt, and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For most of the summer, we've been uh, preaching through a series called Sacred Community and talking about different marks we get from stories in Genesis that tell us what a sacred community looks like. And this morning, we'll get into the story of Joseph, the last major narrative in the book of Genesis. In this morning's readings, you heard the sort of bookends of that story, a beginning that starts with a great conflict between brothers and a story later on of how they're reconciled. We'll spend a little time this morning seeing what sense we can make of that story and what it has to say to us. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, surround us with the grace and love of your word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So every Sunday, uh, when we begin our worship service here at Knox, we make a few announcements. We let you know uh, that we want people to feel welcome. We show you the QR code to find your way to our website. And then we have a time of reflection, right? We invite you to close your eyes and take a deep breath and slow down enough to experience the presence of God surrounding you. And we know that some of you are greatly fed and relieved by this moment of meditation, that opportunity for centering, that reminder that you are loved, that chance to pause at the start of the week. 
And we know that for others of you, it feels like a squishy, awkward waste of time. (laughs) And that it has nothing to do with what makes you feel like a spiritual person. And that's okay. Both are okay. Because here in our sacred community, just about no one agrees on everything, and there is all kinds of difference of opinion, and that, friends, that is how God made us. There are all kinds of manifestations of the differences in our community. Some of you come to worship and you are mesmerized by the beautiful music that inspires us in both of our worship services and others express to me their concerns about how much it must cost. Some are deeply moved by the efforts we make in mission and outreach to help people who are living on the margins, and others are confident that another organization could do a much better job of it. Some of you care deeply about the wellness and the care we show to our building and our grounds, and others talk about the idea that the church is not just a building. Some of you wish that I would say things in the pulpit that lean harder to the left, and others of you wish that I said things that lean harder to the right, and others of you express that you wish I would never mention anything about politics or social issues at all, and it is impossible to keep all of you happy. (laughs) And in plenty of circumstances, because of your passionately held views on each of these topics and many others, you get mad at each other and sometimes we have to apologize and reconcile and try to start over as friends in Christ. We have talked throughout this summer about sacred community and I knew it would be important to talk about this final idea I'm sharing with you today, that in a sacred community, Not a perfect community or an ideal one, but a sacred one. We are all different. And we have different preferences and needs, and we have imperfections that are unique to each of us. And we disagree, and we even fight. And in order for a sacred community to survive, forgiveness and reconciliation must be part of the fabric of who we are so that we can start over again. As with all the sermons in this series, we're drawing the content from these stories from the book of Genesis. And this morning, I want to remind you of this grand narrative that closes the book of Genesis, the story of a far from perfect family that undergoes a lengthy period of brokenness and finally finds a way to get better. Today, we will listen to their story. Joseph was one of the sons of Jacob. He was one of 12, and his older brothers did not like him. You could hardly blame them, for the scripture tells us that Joseph had a pretty high opinion of himself, and he shared it with anyone who he could get to listen. Joseph knew that he was his father Jacob's favorite son. He was given a long robe with sleeves mentioned in that first reading from this morning, the technicolor dream coat as Broadway has talked about it. And he has arrogant dreams that he shares with his brother. One is about sheaves of grain and the other one is about stars in the sky. But in both of them, his brothers and his parents bow down before him. And he wakes up in the morning and he tells them about his dream. So eventually, the brothers get angry enough that they beat him up when they're out in the wilderness one day, and they throw him into a pit. And it's just at that moment that a slave caravan happens by on its way to Egypt, and so they sell their brother into slavery, and they tear up that technicolor dream coat, and they kill an animal and wipe its blood on it so that they can tell their father that their favorite son, Joseph, was tragically attacked by wild animals and that they will never see him again. I'm not sure who you are inclined to agree with in this story of sibling rivalry, but it seems to me like the main idea 
is that this is one messed up family. (laughs) The story that unfolds about Joseph is an amazing story, and it is so worth reading at length. It runs 13 biblical chapters beginning with Genesis 37. It includes Joseph's enslavement in Egypt once he is sent there by his brothers and his creative liberation through the generosity of a powerful man named Potiphar. Potiphar treats him almost like a son, only to throw him back into prison when Potiphar's wife seduces Joseph and accuses him wrongly of rape. Joseph again escapes desperation when he makes his way out of prison by interpreting the troubling dreams of the Pharaoh, the king of all Egypt. By cozying up to the Pharaoh and helping him to lead his country through a famine, Joseph then becomes one of the most powerful men in all of Egypt. Throughout the story, we are told that Joseph's gifts with dream interpretation, that they are God-given. And so we get the impression that even though Joseph experiences these tremendous shifts of fortune, that God is with him. And yet, God's presence does not necessarily make Joseph a holy man. He's got plenty of faults. And in fact, in Genesis 45, one of the things we learn is that Joseph's individual elevation to power is also the means by which all of the people of Israel are eventually enslaved in Egypt. So in this story, we see that nobody is perfect. Jacob, the patriarch, plays favorites with his children. The brothers are deceitful and cruel. The Pharaoh saves his people from death by famine, but only by price gouging all of his neighbors for grain. And Joseph, who is often talked about in Sunday school as the hero of the story, Joseph is egotistical and self-serving, even in the very presence of God and to the detriment of the entire people of Israel. In the midst of all of this brokenness, perhaps the most moving element of the story is that Joseph and his brothers figure out how to forgive one another and start over. In another layer of the story I skipped over, Joseph's brothers, who are threatened by starvation during the famine, they've come to Egypt to buy grain. They arrive at the home of none other than their long-lost brother Joseph, who hides his identity from them, and then sets them up to be arrested for stealing from the royal palace. But when the palace guards drag those brothers back before Joseph, and he finally sees them face to face, he is overcome by grief, because he's face-to-face with all of the time they have lost together because of their conflict. He breaks down in tears, he forgives them for selling him into slavery, and he begs that the unity of their family might be restored. In this story, the brokenness of the family is healed. And it happens because someone is willing to take a chance at forgiveness. I really do encourage you to take some time to go home and read Genesis 37 through 50 on your own time. Read it on your own. Read it with a friend. Do so prayerfully. Talk about it with someone. Think about what questions it raises for you. Because it's a powerful story with all kinds of dimensions, and I think you will find that it carries on its own much more wisdom than I can offer by trying to explain it to you. But I will offer just a few reflections on it that occur to me as I read. Maybe these are some things that you might want to think more about on your own. The first thing that occurs to me when I read this story is that, as the great R.E.M. song had it, everybody hurts. Human brokenness 
Some call it sin. Human brokenness is universal, and it comes in so many forms. Some of us are overly aware of our own faults, and we believe incorrectly that we are unforgivable. Some of us look at others and the struggles that they go through and fear that those things are unresolvable and that the world is hopeless. Some of us struggle with anger and resentment toward others. We lie awake at night and we struggle through the day wasting our time and brooding about things in the past or the present or the future that we feel helpless to do anything about. In whatever form it comes, there is no denying it. Brokenness is all over the place. And so reconciliation is one of the most important marks of sacred community. We have to figure out wherever we can how to forgive one another so that we can heal and get better. Another thing this story shows us is how difficult it is to forgive and start over. It is not a naive story when it comes to that. Joseph really struggles to reconcile with his brothers. He avoids and deceives them many times before they come to peace with one another. And if you were paying attention, the story says that by the time he finally gets real with his brothers, Joseph, quote, could no longer control himself and fell on his brother's neck and wept. I imagine some of you have witnessed a moment like that in your own families or among friends or somewhere else. Maybe you. Often people are so overcome with guilt or anger or fear and have been carrying it for so long that by the time it comes to the surface, they can no longer control themselves and weep uncontrollably. This story is real. And it isn't that, it isn't until that breakdown, that getting real, that the healing can begin. It's after the weeping that the story says the brothers sat down and they began to talk. What was that talk like? What did they say? What could they no longer say? What could they still not say? What opened up in that time where they finally spoke again after all that hurt and all those years? On the other side of reconciliation, this family is not fixed or perfect, and they will sin again, but they are no longer carrying the burden of their hate or the illusion of their perfection on one side of the struggle. What was it like for them to finally get real? And finally, I'll offer that sometimes, sometimes it takes a very, very long time for reconciliation to take place, and sometimes it doesn't happen. Plenty of Bible stories are about conflicts that don't get resolved, but a community community that gathers in the name of God, a sacred community, is one that is meant to stand for something better. For the world is full of stories of hurt, but the world is also full of stories of unforeseen forgiveness and grace, and we all long for a world that is different and better God is always up to something. Even in the midst of hard times, I believe that. I sometimes find myself in the midst of some problem or conflict that I cannot make sense of, finally abandoning my own pride and opening my hands to heaven to ask, God, what are you trying to tell me in this? 
And usually the answer does not come right away. Being in a sacred community that involves difference is a choice. And many choose not to do it because it is hard. But it is important. Think about the many families or office environments, schools or community groups or political situations in which people refuse to be part of a community with others with whom they disagree. They only want to be around people just like them or with whom they always get along. I know what it's like to want that. And we can do it if we want to. People do that all the time. But in sacred communities, people are called to be together in a way that acknowledges brokenness and pain so that we can work to repair it. We live in the plain sight of God, where none of us are perfect, but where forgiveness is real. It is something to aspire to, for we don't do it perfectly, and we don't have it yet. But wanting more of it is God's gift to us. Amen.